and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This podcast is sponsored by Syncback Pro, the professional photographer's tool to keep your images safe. How safe are your photographs? Or to put it this way, how would you feel if you permanently lost some or even all of them? The fact is, there are very real risks in storing your digital images on a hard drive, even if they're backed up to an external device. There's ransomware, hardware failure, file corruption, virus infection, and even accidental deletion or destruction. Syncback Pro makes this problem go away permanently. Syncback Pro is the professional photographer's tool to back up photographs, images, documents, and data files. Once set up, it keeps your files safe, quietly and reliably in the background. So if problems occur or disaster strikes, you'll have nothing to worry about. Your photographs will be safe. Which is why it's also the backup solution that I use myself for my own photographs. Take advantage of an exclusive 25% discount today by going to www.backup.sg. The software will never expire, meaning your photographs are safe forever. That's www.backup.sg. Give your photographs the protection they deserve. And now, on with the show. This week's episode is something a little bit different. Bree Stockwell and Len Metcalf, both brilliant landscape photographers in their own right, started their podcast, A Creative Affair, a little while ago after meeting during an after-party for Matt Payne's podcast, F Stock Collaborate and Listen. Their podcast is a collection of lively conversations exploring creativity through the art of photography and other creative passions. Bree is an American photographer and life coach who's been exploring her own creativity through her work in nature and landscape photography since 2019. Bree challenged herself to exhibit 10 of her best images in 2020 in what she calls an impossible goal. Through this challenge, Bree learned a lot about herself, which has opened several doors in her life. Len began his passion for photography in the late 60s when his father gifted him his first camera. Growing up in Australia's spectacular Blue Mountains provided Len with an endless array of incredible scenes to capture, and he particularly loves the light and mood of misty wet landscapes abundant in that region. In 2000, Len opened his own gallery in Katoomba. Combining his flair for both education and photography made perfect sense, and not long after, Len's school was created. Len has become renowned as a leading photographic educator through teaching, mentoring and facilitating innovative workshops and tours. We discuss how the pair view creativity, how their shared passion has blossomed into an online partnership, the vagaries of social media and photography, along with much, much more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Brian Len. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Awesome. I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, very well. And... Great to have two people on the podcast for the first time. I've never done a, uh, a three-way, so this is going to be a, an interesting experience, I think, for all of us. <laughs> I think it will be the same for us as well. It's a, a very exciting experience uh, to get together this way. Yeah. And on someone else's podcast, three people on someone else's <laughs> podcast, so that's really fun. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, I guess what I normally do is ask people a little bit about themselves and how they got started. So I might do that and start with you, Bree, and then move on to Len. But then I want to have a bit of a conversation around creativity and some of the topics you raise in your podcast. Because uh, for those that um, haven't listened to the intro because they uh, they skip that and get to the meat of <laughs> the podcast... Uh, Lee and uh, sorry, Le- Bree and Len have their own podcast uh, called A Creative Affair, and uh, I want to talk to them a little bit about how that uh, collaboration came together and how it's going and uh, where they see it going in the future. So why don't we start first though with Bree talking a little bit about how she uh, came into landscape photography. I feel like that was a little Freudian slip. So we're either Lee or Bren. 
because <laughs> I saw Len laugh. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, yes. So it's like, you know, our names combined. Anyway, that's so fun. Um, yeah. Thanks for having us on, Grant. This is really fun to be on your podcast and uh, and kind of like, it's like worlds colliding. So it's awesome. Uh, so a little, just a little bit about me. I started I really started pursuing landscape photography in December of 2019. I have to go back and say I've always owned a camera, but I I actually thought that I had to take pictures of like big pictures of people. And mm-hmm. I think I got a lot of, uh, frustrated because I I I was like I'm not good at posing people and you know all those things, but I always gravitated towards detail and textures and shiny things and not necessarily images of people. So in December of 2019, I was in this coaching program and I made this really big goal. Like we were challenged to do the impossible in 2020. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go all in and do the photography that I want to do. Because just before that, I had decided that more nature photography was for me, that I don't have to have people in my images, like, because I was getting frustrated. So anyway, so I did the whole next year, a lot of work. And I put myself kind of through a master's program um, in the year 2020. <laughs> I mean, this is a self-created one. And I my goal was to host a solo exhibition. And I did it in my home in March of 2021. And it's a it's I just had the two-year anniversary of it this week. And it is Fantastic. so it right. And it's so fun to look backwards and um and remember all of the details of that time and because it was all new for me and mm. printing my, like I learned how to print my own work. And I, for the first time ever, I had people coming and to look at my work in person and sharing those experiences. Anyway, I could probably go on, on and on about that. But since then I've done some really super fun stuff. I've gone a lot of places. I've, um, I, I'm exploring now, where I really want to be. I have a trip to like, I go, love going out to the dunes, um, specifically White Sands National Park. I've got a trip there this next week. Can't wait. Fantastic. And anyway, I think it's just more about refining and exploring my own creative voice now. So brilliant. anyway, and I'm in Austin, Texas, for those who don't know, and I have four adult kids happily wow. married. It's awesome. <laughs> I love it here. <laughs> Fantastic. How about you, Lane? I don't remember picking up my first camera. I've got total blank on that. I, I do remember taking it apart to figure out how the shutter worked. Yeah. Uh, I My first photographic love was actually macro, and uh, we had a set of extension tubes and some um, macro lenses, and I was a very young boy, and I pointed it at bees and wasps and spiders and all those beautiful things. And started photographing the natural world. Like that was my first subject. Mm. And uh, uh, somewhere along the line, I became an an incredibly um, passionate environmentalist. I grew up to uh, Pete Seeger's God Bless the Grass album um, (laughs) and uh, these uh, lovely hippie ideals of uh, living in a beautiful uh, planet um, free of pollution and loving each other and also the environment. So uh, it was very natural for me to to turn my camera, particularly when I went to art school, yep. uh, immediately to the environment. And uh, I was panned for it. My final works for art school in photography, I created an incredibly beautiful in- installation. I built a, a studio. Okay. It was actually in the copy room. And I had four major projects in there or three. I had photos around the walls. I had a portfolio and a handmade book. Mm. And um, it was incredibly beautiful. And I came out and I happened to walk past one of the senior painting lecturers going, there's more effing photos of bloody trees and stormed <laughs> off. And I thought I'd failed. And my two um, other lecturers, because it was a panel of three, gave me straight distinctions for my room and I couldn't find them at art school and they were actually hiding in there. And I, I, one day I I knocked on the door and they were in the, in my room and they're going, this is the most beautiful place in the whole of the art school. Fantastic. And you know, that turning my camera to nature 
has always been just a part of who I am. And I have an incredibly strong belief about the environment. And I'm a very, very passionate greenie, a conservationist, and I've taught um, environmentalism my whole way through. Just as a little example, I, I, I opened the annual general meeting for the um, Royal Photographic Society recently okay. um, with a speech. So I actually talked about the Tarkine in Australia as one of the threatened um, rainforests in, in our country. And, you know, it's the largest Gondwana land rainforest mm. we have left and we're mining it and stripping it with um, cutting the trees down. So I used that opportunity to talk about environmentalism through my work and try to educate people about what's going on. So uh, turning to nature is a uh, part of who I am I, and I honestly get peace and happiness from my relationship with trees. Fantastic. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> I guess that leads me into what motivates both of you creatively. What, are, what is it that drives that passion? Is it for you, Len, that love of trees and for you, Bree, the love of sand dunes or <laughs> <laughs> something else? You want me to go first, Len? Yeah. yeah he's, I can tell he's waiting for I can tell you're waiting for me. <laughs> I'm so um, polite. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> Uh, I think I love, okay. I love a challenge. First of all, mm -hmm. I love to go through the process of challenging myself in new ways. And it's, it's not always easy. Um, but I think, I think it's been, let me think for a second. It's been a really fun experience to give myself challenges to go new places and find what, what sparks my creativity. Like what, where does my intuition call me? And this is, this has been a really fun process. And I think that's what I'm passionate about is the process of it. And then, and feeling that really intimate connection with myself and I call it my creative spirit and that creative spirit that when I, that when I have a go to a place that invokes that, sure. that real like sense of awe that, you know, I'm, I'm like looking for that. And so I know that there are places that I can go back and, and do that with, but I, I think the whole process of, I, I mean, I've been to new places and I'm like, Oh, this I have to come back here. Mm -hmm. And I, because I think, and it, it shows up in your work too, when yep. that, when you can make that connection. And that's, that's kind of what yeah. drives me, I think. Do you, do you feel that uh, process of repetition and going back to the same locations helps you in that? Uh, yes, but not always. It has to be a place that really, that really speaks to me. Mm -hmm. Or that I'm really interested in. I, I have a place actually nearby. Um, and we're we're doing a little video, but this place, <laughs> it's okay. my local yep. creek right here, uh -huh. and and it's like a puzzle. It's it's been like a puzzle, and it looks different all the time. And so I just keep going back and back and back to try and piece together the puzzle. Mm. And um, so that's one that's one part of what drives me is like, I'm like, there's, there's something more here. There's something more here, you know? And then there's also returning to places where I feel just completely blown over with inspiration. Like white mm. sands is, is yeah. also like, I'm always, I, that's why I'm going there for a week. Like I couldn't spend a week at my Creek, <laughs> <laughs> but I can spend a week. I'm like, I am going to go get sand in my eyes and in my hair and it's going to be everywhere and in my camera and I'm going to totally love it. So, you know. Fantastic. Yeah. What about you, Lane? I've been sitting here trying to come up with a good solid answer for you and I've got about 30 um, <laughs> swirling through my head and I'm serious that there's so many reasons about this and to nail one is quite hard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I did, as a very young man, turn to art as a way of escapism. And I used mm. to spend hours and hours drawing and painting and uh, whether I was hiding from the world or not, um, maybe from my family, um, it gave me a, an incredible 
amount of peace. And um, drawing is a self-soothing activity through repetition. So you calm yourself down. And uh, I also was reading a book last night, uh, A Few of the Legends by Peter Adams, and uh, there was an incredible quote in there where someone said, I can't wish I could remember who it was now, but they said the uh, a shy person can learn to be themselves through their camera. Mm. And um, photography has actually taught me to be me and has brought out that shyness um, because I've been able to put a camera between me and other people for a while and uh, something really magical has happened there as well. Yeah. And uh, I've, I really believe that art and the making of art is a, a healing and self sort of learning process so that through making art, uh, I've actually become a better person and I've also become more understanding of who I am and how I like to work and uh, uh, it's taught me so many things. So I'm totally addicted to it and I've been in some incredible experiences and uh, I'll just give you one as an example um, where the the chemical rush that I get, the high that I get from actually taking photographs um, is so good. Um, it's better than any drug I've ever taken, I can assure you of that. Mm. And it's, um, it, it's, it's an actually an addictive thing. So I was in um, the top of South um, Africa with um, Freeman Patterson and uh, a storm really brewed up uh, in Namibia and uh, it was – ridiculously hot it was in it in the 40 degrees and we couldn't shoot past eight o'clock in the morning like it's you spend the whole day asleep and um you know we escaped for the day in our car just to drive around in the air conditioning for a few hours to <laughs> yeah. calm down and cool off and, and we came back and this storm's brewing and a huge sandstorm and rain blew into town well, like we're camped in the middle of uh, a mountain desert yep and uh it was at sunset and the sky and the red rocks lit up bright red, like really red and glowed. And we photographed in the rain and the wind and the sand and wasn't good for our cameras or ourselves. But anyway, um, we got back to camp after this incredible experience and we were as high as a kite. You know, our tents were on the floor. We had to have dinner um, standing, drinking soup from a cup. We, uh, the chairs were broken. They were covered in water. Everything was messed up. And we were just so excited about the colours <laughs> that we'd just been photographing. And, you know, I didn't even get good photographs uh, okay. of that experience, okay. but the experience of that light and being with a group of people and getting so excited about it, I was off my face. And um, I call them peak photographic experiences for a, a want of a better name but i am totally addicted to them and i want another one and uh, i've had so many of them where i get so immersed in the creation process that the rest of the world disappears and uh, i get high from it so oh, that's wonderful <laughs> uh, that's part of my motivation is an addiction to that incredible enjoyment that i get from it yeah it sounds uh, Sorry, go on. Can I can I say something? Like, yeah. Glenn, that story, because you haven't told this story. I haven't heard this one. But you just, to, to, I don't know about for everyone else that's listening, but you just totally took me there. Like, oh, I was like, fine. a picture. Were you too, Grant? Like, yeah, all of totally. the storm and all, you know, I mean, I was I right there the, with you, I Lynn. I feel the rain and the wind and the, uh, yes. the sand blowing around me. <laughs> I know. And you need goggles for this, by the way. If you're going to photograph in a sandstorm, you need to have goggles and you need to have a mask so you can, you know, get, look at your camera. Anyway. Definitely. definitely. Um, I, I want to touch on something you said a little bit earlier, in, uh, Len, around that intersection, I guess, of um, creativity and personal identity, because it sounded to me like there's a really strong role that self-expression plays in your artistic vision. How how do you see that sort of, you know, playing out, I guess? Playing out. It's a, I had to learn that. I, I didn't, at art school, they tell you, oh, you your art has to be about you and about the yep. world and uh, you need to uh, 
have these political views and express yourself. And I didn't understand what they were talking about. I was like, I'm taking photos of bloody trees because we need to save them. It's really simple. It's really clear. Yep. But I didn't understand that I actually have some sort of relationship from trees and I get, um, you know, a mental creative energy from them that I mm. want to um, do something for them and I feel like a bit of a warrior for them. So uh, that energy feeds my creativity and then pushes me along to keep producing more work and the, um, uh, understanding how I grow and learn and get peace from these environments. Like if I'm really stressed, uh, I go for a walk in a forest and I calm down. It's really quite yeah, simple. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, I tie that into my art, uh, the things that uh, excite me, that calm me, that interest me, that are intellectually stimulating, I tie them into my art um, and explore who I am through them. And so this growth becomes inevitable, uh, particularly as I, I want to get better um, I can only technically get so good. The rest has to come from within, mm, uh, mm. considering about where I'm pointing the camera and why. Uh, the technical bit, you know, I had that mastered 30 years ago or 40 years ago. That wasn't very hard to get technically proficient at, at what we do, but uh, the rest has been, well, how do I have something more meaningful to say or how do I become... Um, how do I improve my work once I'm technically okay? Yeah. And yeah. the answer has been to turn inwardly and, and also uh, to explore this connection with uh, Mother Nature. Oh, fantastic. I, I will echo that, that, that I think that being able to grow as a photographer, uh, once you master the technical, you... Mm you have to be able to do that. And I think that's something that I learned easy, like early on was, okay, I'm, I'm working on mastering the technical, but what more is there? Like if you've ever asked yourself, like what more is there to this work than walking outside and pointing your camera at something? That's the connecting factor is you have to be able to have a, a deeper connection personally to your subject, even if it's just you feel that drawn to it, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so I, I really, I really think that that's, that's how you get better is you, you have to know yourself better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So crazy. It is. It is. I guess, and that leads me to the, a similar sort of question. What role does that self, expression play in shaping your artistic vision well let me let me kind of pull back a little bit um because i think in order to understand my artistic vision i have to well you know i have to understand myself but i when i first started this work um i hope i don't get emotional i've been a little emotional lately <laughs> Well, that's fine. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's all right. I had a cry this morning too. So okay, yeah, all right. That's alone. fine. I, I, yes, I'm going to have one right. after this. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, then maybe we just all combine ours together. That's right. Um, <laughs> so I I really feel like through this work, um, I, I, I have actually pushed on myself to become bet more in touch with my emotions mm. and – for a long time, I felt more a little stoic. I didn't really understand why I was feeling a certain way, why I was experiencing the things I was. And it wasn't until I really started understanding art and the artistic photography, because that's what we're talking about for me anyway, until I really started to dive into my own emotions and understand those and why I was feeling a certain way and be able to tap into all of that, then it's it's since then that I can start expressing um, an artistic vision. And, and I don't know that – I actually just had a conversation um, with someone <laughs> on Instagram recently, but uh, I think it was Jason Pettit. Um, mm -hmm. And 
And we were saying, well, what is our style? You know, because someone else told me, well, I, I can see your style yeah, when yeah. one of your images shows up and, and he's had that said to him. And Len, I bet someone said this to you, right? Like, you know, uh, right. And so, um, and when, as we, I didn't even know that that was a thing for me because mm -hmm. it was as I've been tapping into who I am and what more, I don't even sometimes know what I want to say. I think that's, I think I make the photo that I feel inspired to make and then it catches up later. Like I don't yeah. always know until I, until I look at it. And so that's when I can put images together and go, oh, that's the vision that I was having for it, um, and you know, or for my work, and I don't know that I have necessarily a whole vision, but I just know that it has everything to do with my own personal emotions. Maybe that is my vision. I don't yeah, know. that's cool. That's cool. I guess I mean, just listening to both of you there, one of the things that sort of struck me, uh, one of the things that I love doing is seascaping, and I'm absolutely happiest knee deep in water on a rock shelf somewhere with uh, lots of wave action. And it wasn't until this conversation right now that I've kind of realised where that harks back to for myself personally. And it's really from when I was a child, uh, I grew up one street away from a beach and we were always down at the beach playing in the water, etc. And that connection, I guess, is is really only just now clicked for me um and which kind of surprises me because i thought i knew why i did a lot of what i do <laughs> you know right before this len goes I th aren't you always comfortable in sand or no was that you len that, i think that no. was my friend no i was chatting with my friend on the phone and she goes oh yeah you're going back to the dunes um have you always loved sand and i said oh I actually think I have, right? Because I grew up yeah. in California, so I was close to always to the beach. And on that same vein, Grant, I remember, and this was a realization I had maybe about a year and a half ago. I'm like, why do I love rock so much? Because I love rock textures and their mm, colors. Sorry. And I'm like, why do I, yep. yeah, why do I like them so much? And I real I remembered, duh. I had a rock collection when I was like in <laughs> elementary school. In fact, I have some of it in these bins behind me because I just keep them close. So I'm like, oh, that's right. I had a rock collection. I always love those. It's like going back to my roots and so interesting. The things that we, it's like, it's like almost like hardwired into us what we might be passionate about. And maybe at, we lose some of that when we're kids and then it's about reconnecting. I, I'm not saying that always happens, but for me, certainly. So maybe for you, that realization too, you yeah, know. No. <laughs> I am. Um, it's such a valuable thing to, to ask yourself and to explore. And you don't actually ever know when the answer comes up. Like you can be asking like, oh, why do I love sand? I have this, I have a fascination for sand too. Mm. And, and I love being at the water too. And I, the ocean scares the hell out of me. Like I couldn't swim very well, but I still find an incredible peace for it. And mm. some mm. spots on the ocean I connect with um, greater than others. And I couldn't work that out. And uh, the other one day I was like, oh, the trees grow right to the ocean here. And uh, when I hit that, I was like, oh, no wonder I feel something special here. And then I looked and I was noticing the plants. So these are the same plants and the same micro environment as the one that I grew up in. And wow. so uh, you often find that you uh, are doing this beautiful work and you don't know why. Yeah, And then uh, over time, you know, a long time, not just suddenly, um, quickly, these little realizations come to you out of the blue and you go, oh, okay, that's what that's tied to. And mm. uh, um, you see, I, I was in a podcast a, a few weeks ago and uh, the person said, you know, you obviously like exhibiting your work. Are you much of an exhibit ex exhibitionist? <laughs> and it started this whole thinking about, hang on, I did, I put an artwork in an art exhibition when I was 14 and I sold it. Fantastic. And I can describe the artwork to you. And that actually became also 
a, an addictive thing. So mm. every year afterwards I was putting stuff back into the, the same local, it's just the local art prize in the local municipality in the city. Um, but that's become an addiction. Like a, I've had so many exhibitions. I get, I, I just get so excited. Or someone wants one of their prints, my prints, on their wall. I get really excited. So that's another one of the thirty answers as to yeah. what motivates me. Is I actually picked up something um, from when I was fourteen. That's uh, so like fun. you. You know, you grew up on the beach, and you just suddenly, oh, that's that's what it is. And these just keep happening. Um, and the more you concentrate and think about them the more you understand yourself. And I think this is where um, photography and art can really teach us to be better people or to understand ourselves so much better. Yeah. And, and I, I'd like to say too that I really think, because I always like, uh, what can I learn from this? I don't always have to think that. But once I figured out why I love something or what inspired me, then I'm like, oh, that's where I'm making really authentic work that you know, authentic work where I feel really connected or I love what comes out of it. And so then it's like, as photographers, how can we set ourselves up for success? You know, once we find those things, then how can we, you know, repeat that, put that on repeat? Because, you know, that's how we're going to make work that we really love. I mean, I just had, you know, I just saw a conversation with Eric Bennett and he was like, I have 58 photos of dead leaves or leaves on my website. Why is that? I don't, oh no, he wrote an article and he's like, I don't go out looking for them, but it's what he's attracted to. He ends up becoming attracted to those things. And then we make the work of things that were attracted. So he knows if I go out, I'm sure he knows if I go out at this time, I'm going to make work that resonates with me. And it just so happens sometimes to be leaves. <laughs> so. yeah. A good question to ask him is about uh, life and death because a, a, a mm. leaf's about wabi-sabi, isn't it? This, um, That's right. Uh, this uh, returning to the earth and becoming new nutrients. Yeah, and becoming it's, um, food for Becoming food and it's life, also yeah. incredibly beautiful, isn't it? A, a, a leaf is an incredible symbol. Mm. Oh, mm. I wonder, <laughs> Eric, I'm going to send this to you and then answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about life and death? Okay, all right. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love that conversation we just had about uh, the practice of self-reflection and introspection and uh, how that can sort of deepen our understanding of our own creative processes and, I guess, identify areas for growth and development. How do you identify those areas for growth and development? I'll let I you go my first. Intuition. <laughs> Uh, well, that, and it's such a hard thing to do, but I'm looking for signs, symbols, for, um, you know, things that capture my attention and take mm. me off into new directions. And um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about how um, my art is a result of everything I've experienced and seen and been involved in throughout my life. And it's, in a sense, derivative of who I am and the experiences that I've had. So uh, as I continue on, when something grabs my attention, and it could be just something small, like I, I might be walking along and the, the wind blows through and hits me in the face and I'm like, oh, I wonder what I was thinking at that moment. And uh, I might actually follow that as a thought. So that's like a, a sign or something for me. But uh, it might just be an artwork that really grabs me and, and moves me and then I start to wanting it, exploring it. So. Uh, I think I'm, I try to be open to uh, suggestions from the world for directions. And sometimes they come deeply from within and I wake up going, oh, I've got to do this. Um, but often and, and most often it's like an inspiration from something else that goes, oh, that's an interesting idea. I wonder what that's like. Mm. What happens when I go and pursue that and, and to do that? And so that drives me along. Yeah, cool. I feel like I'm the total opposite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As That's is how good. we it's how we roll. Uh because I like to on purpose, I will go and create scenarios where I'm pushing myself a little bit. And it's in the it like for example, I'm 
I'm <laughs> creating an ebook right now. It's my first yeah. one. And it's going to be, it's actually going to be about, uh, my, my, um, kind of my journey to do my solo exhibition and uh, hopefully, I don't know when this will come out, but hopefully I'm done with it by then. But it's, it's about some of the things I learned and how uh, people can actually, you know, take those things and repeat them for themselves. But anyway, um, but I like to, when, so, so I'm working on this ebook and I know it's going to push me. I already feel uncomfortable and it's, I have this t-shirt that says, um, uh, something about discomfort and growth, like growth is growth is in the discomfort. And so I will yep. on purpose create scenarios where I know I'm going to feel some discomfort. And then because I'm a, because I, um, I'm trained. I'm a I'm a certified life coach and I'm in I have some training. And so I can start to pick out where I'm feeling the resistance and the discomfort and find that and then figure out and then start to, you know, start to peel back the onion of that and figure out like, okay, now where is my growth here? Because I didn't know that some there were some things that I've been hanging on to that I didn't know in this whole process. I just discovered one the other day and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. All right. So let's, you know, let's peel back the onion on that. And sometimes they're quick, they're quick, it's quick growth. And sometimes I have to sit with it for a while and wonder why I'm experiencing that or why I'm having like why I'm having this reaction to something or what it, you know, what is next. And, um, mm -hmm. so I do a lot of like introspection and pushing myself on purpose so I can get that. So yeah. Len, Len lets the breeze take him and I walk straight <laughs> into the breeze on purpose. And <laughs> so. there's a, oh. one other thing I do a lot of, and that's actually, um, work on projects. So I mm -hmm. look at my work and I allow um, myself to group things together and then I yeah. start creating imaginary projects. And uh, like Brie, they push me and uh, like I, once I create one, then I pursue it quite religiously uh, over mm. time. And uh, uh, often that's a matter of noticing it happening in my work. But once I name it and I start putting it together, um, i I have a huge bag of projects that I carry around with me that I can just dip into at any time mm. and start working on. And that's an, an incredibly helpful thing for me to do. And I, I love publishing. So getting them out into the world is very, very important to me. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that too on that same vein. And I just discovered, well, I have a collection already, but I just discovered another image for this project. And I'm like, maybe I want to <laughs> tap into this, right? It's called, like, I put a couple images in this one collection that I titled Dead Stuff in the Desert. And I realized that now I have, I know it sounds crazy. It sounds no, I, crazy. I, I, I love it. <laughs> but at, like, I, I'm discovering, I'm I'm making photos of literally like dead plants that are hanging out in the, I have a, I have a whole, I have an image of a dead Joshua tree. That's just all texture. Mm. I like walked this crazy um, kind of Canyon back in Nevada. And I have a photo of just a dead plant in the middle of the <laughs> anyway, but you know, it's these kinds of things that, you know, as we start realizing and grouping things, that's right. Len, to your point is then we find out like, oh, I'm gravitating towards this. This is something that I might want to dig into a little bit and learn a little bit more about. And maybe I want to put myself in those places where I learn more. I mean, I don't, how do I, how do I go find dead stuff? <laughs> I just Very wander on the desert. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So I need to go up to like Santa Fe. I'm going to go do that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> sounds, sounds amazing. <laughs> I guess that, that leads me to the question around how you can challenge yourself to think outside the box. I know having projects for both of you is uh, very important, but I guess how do you bring new ideas into those projects as opposed to just sort of plodding along yeah, you know, doing the same old, same old for each project. And what what sort of techniques are you using to actually uh, delve into your grab bag of ideas and then 
put those projects in into life. And I don't mind who goes first. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I will say we just, this has, well, I was going to say this has nothing to do with photography, but this is not, not true. So, um, we, we did a podcast episode, uh, back in, I think we aired it at the end of January and I kind of participated along with this, this art movement called creative February. Okay. And it's, it's really amazing because, because it's about getting into your art every day in February. Mm. And I challenged myself to do something totally different, to think differently and to do some painting. And I had some thoughts, lead nose, I had some thoughts that I was a little stuck on. And so for me, uh, how do I challenge myself is actually go do something else. So that was challenging for me. And, and I'm like, oh, how, how does, I don't think I'm going to find this out now, but how does what I, the work that I did, how is that going to relate to my photography? And honestly, I'm still kind of waiting um, to make some connections, but I know that they will come because it's doing those things is, uh, it's really good to just stretch your brain, just doing something a little different mm. will stretch your brain. And then later you'll find out, you'll find out what the connection is, you know. Oh, there's so many more things, but Len. I'm I'm giggling here because I was going to say virtually the same thing, but <laughs> doing something else. Um, like one of my favorites is to have a hiatus and uh, to stop that subject. Yeah. And I go, yeah. uh, I go like if I'm doing flowers and uh, I'm feeling that my flowers are getting stuck, I go and do something totally different, like mm. my two trees. But um, I actually put my camera down for long periods of time and uh, I concentrate on reading, on studying other people's work, on going to see movies or uh, a whole lot of other parts of life um, to get away from it. And, and this breathing space uh, that you can create, and it doesn't really matter how you create it, uh, allows for your mind to process and to come back and go, well, okay, let's try something new and fresh. So yeah, uh, I'm always pushing against um, doing the same thing um, by experimenting with something else. And That's speaking right. of experimenting with something else, I just, yeah. why, why did I not start with this? So in last summer, well, your winter. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're in Australia. Anyway, last August, Tara, how about I say that? Uh, I, I I don't know why. Maybe it was July. I felt like I needed to um, get my hands on an infrared camera body. Len knows this whole journey. And mm. and um, I, for some reason, I don't know, but I listened to these things. And so a friend of mine who's a photographer um, helped me he, you know, kind of guided me on procuring one. And I did a road trip in September and brought that thing along with me. And sometimes I would go hiking and that was all I brought and, and handheld. And I am, a, listen, I have in the past been a color photographer stuck on my tripod. Yeah. And this camera now, because it's, because I was able to release a lot of my, like, I'm like, this is just fun. I don't have to be serious about this. Like I can just play and yeah. find something. That's, that's what's fun is finding something that's just a little bit different that you don't feel tied to, you know, mm -hmm. especially like for me, not uh, feeling like I have to do serious work. And I have to tell you, I mean, this was probably on a tripod, but I went out hiking with a friend of mine in Utah and, um, did I, and, and I made one of my most favorite images from last year with that camera. And it was so fun. I didn't, I had zero, like really zero expectations because I'm just playing around. And I think that is kind of challenging to ourselves to kind of twist like how, and, how we think. And that camera, I have to look through the viewfinder, the, you know, to be able to see what it looks like. I'm getting better, but because it's not what we normally see, Len mm -hmm. could explain that. I'm sure I just know what I see when I put it, you know, <laughs> when I turn it on, but, um, because it's totally different. Like yeah. when I put it on monochromatic, it like all the leaves are white. 
And that's yeah. just not what our eyes see, right? And so, okay. yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's so fun to just figure out how to go out and play, whether it's a different lens or, you know, I, I don't know, whatever it is that feels like fun and playful, also that. Yeah, this- I, I got to agree that that sense of fun and playfulness, and I guess harking back to your your childhood mentality, is uh, is a really good way of uh, kicking off your creative juices. And it's one of the things that I I do as, as frequently as I can. You know, and I also use the techniques of changing things up. I've just spent two months in the UK, and that really refreshed me. For I mean, doing. Very little in the ter- in terms of seascaping, did a little bit, but you know, very little. Mostly, it was quiet, calm winter landscapes of bare oak trees and architecture in the Cotswolds and that sort of thing, which is <laughs> not what I normally do. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, that really kicked off the desire. And I, when I got back home, I, I just couldn't wait to go out and get knee deep in uh, seawater again. <laughs> <laughs> There's something really magical about the unknown. Absolutely. And I think um, what Bree was talking about there with we don't know what it's going to do until you hold it up to your eyes. There's so many people love that and yeah. uh, actually mm. bring that into their work. And uh, I've let go many, many years ago of trying to imagine what I'm going to do before I get somewhere. I just go and yeah. experience and experiment and explore and I really love the unknown and it becomes quite addictive. So I just take a, a tiny idea and then go and play with it to see um, what can come out of the unknown. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's worth working into your process. Uh, and I think so many of us were taught by, you know, reading books like um, by um, Minor White or Ansel Adams about this whole visualisation. You need to stand there and imagine the whole finished thing in your mind. Yeah, and we yeah. work in this way. Um, but today, no, not at all. I, I go and play and see what comes out. And if I take a thousand photos in two hours, well, so be it. And uh, why not enjoy that as a process and yeah, um, yeah. play? And I'm I'm always totally surprised by the ones that appear that are almost accidental um, in this process. So uh, I think the unknown is incredibly beautiful. Yeah, um, totally agree. That, totally in that agree. process. Um, you, you kind of touched on one of the questions that I almost always ask, and that is around uh, when you're uh, in the field, how do you actually – or uh, sorry – I'm going to ask that question again. <laughs> you, t- you kind of touched on one of the questions that I almost always ask, and that is, are you a planner or a more spontaneous photographer? So do you sit there and visualise? And obviously, Len, I, we, n- we now know where you stand. How about you, Bri? Are you a <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Everyone, or- st- everyone stop right now. Raise your hand if you think Len is not a planner. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. I actually know that sometimes... He does make plans, but you know, I think it has its time and place. I'm, I'm, I'm talking incredibly more about methodical the... too. So, yeah. like, if I'm photographing a tree, I can guarantee you that I'll walk the whole way around it and work it from many, many angles and sure. for uh, half an hour. Like, I'll work one tree for half an hour. That's that is methodical and planned. But um, yeah, the, the experimental is all. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I try to in, in be balanced and, and and work with both in that sense. I'm stubborn as hell. <laughs> <laughs> what? So what about you, Bree? You, do you plan your shoots or are you more spontaneous? Yes. The answer is yes to both. Good. And here's what I mean. <laughs> here's what I mean. And remember, I, I talked earlier about um, setting ourselves up for success. And so, like, I know. So I'm going to New Mexico next week. I know where I'm going. I know when the weather gets to be a certain something where I'm going to go and partly because I'm familiar with it. Um, and, but when I get there, I, I look around and go, which way should I walk today? Right. And so 
if if I know that I'm going to a place where it doesn't matter, where I can spontaneously walk or you know move in any direction, and I trust myself that I either am going to either enjoy the process and maybe have some, maybe get to know myself better, even if I don't make an image. But you know mm. what? I used to be worried that I wasn't going. I think a lot of this planning is because we're worried. I don't think this is always true because I think there are sometimes you like want to plan, especially when you're doing like nightscape photography and you know, yeah, yeah. that a lot of times you, you know, that you want to plan that. There's of photography you need to plan. For, yeah, 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 exactly. Or like, um, you know, I love making pictures of like, let's say you love beautiful green ferns. We're not going to go out in winter time, you know, to photograph those unless you're in a different country or somewhere else where it's warm. Right. So, um, but I, I think a lot of times when when we're doing the planning and over planning, it's because we don't trust ourselves to make the work that we love. We think we're mm-hmm. going to go out and not have any success. And we're really worried about failing at at what we're doing. Like, yeah. oh, I'm going to go all the way to New Mexico. And, you know, because I could think – Mm, I have thought this before. I'm going to go all the way there. And what if I don't have anything to show for it or bring back or, you know, you know, yep. all my, all these people are expect like, like hundred percent. When I say I'm on my way to New Mexico, everyone's going to say, I can't wait to see what you do. And I'm going to say, you'll probably see it in a year, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, or if any, and uh, no, for sure. I'm I'll share, but, but I don't, I'm not going to do it right away, but I, I think it's about trusting ourselves and I want to trust myself that I can walk in any direction yeah. and find something that's inspiring, find something that's interest in, interesting to me because I am now more experienced at listening to my intuition and letting it guide me. Mm. And I maybe don't always come away with like blow you over award-winning images, but maybe sometimes I do. And I'm great with both. That's great. That's great. How do you push past creative blocks and then overcome those sorts of challenges? Usually I find that they're self-imposed blocks rather than anything that's really happening out in the environment. Uh, Aside from when we had lockdown, that was a slightly different uh, situation. But I guess I'm, I'm re- interested in how you sort of push past and, and move around those creative blocks that are occasionally occur. Len, you want well, to tackle I walk, that? I, I have some, I have thoughts too, but. I walk mine out is one way of doing it. Yep. And uh, that just works for me. Um, but doing something, I, the same answer I had before about doing something else yeah. uh, actually releases me and, uh, it is the best answer. <laughs> like giving yourself. I have a space, different one. <laughs> giving you well, this is my best answer. It gives me space to, and and of course I'm talking from my own perspective, but yeah. it gives me space to process and to think about things. And uh, you know, most of our brain, it's like an iceberg. Um, mm. The bit that sticks out the top is the bit that we think and we access mentally up there, but most of our brain is underneath the subconscious and we don't actually access that in a, a, a cognizant, is that the right word, way? Yep. Um, it happens subconsciously and it needs time to work. Mm. And uh, it's probably ahead of the bit that's up the, the top. They, um, a few people have said it's often a year ahead. Um, it needs time to do its work and then we have to catch up with it. So having these little breaks um, and and by doing something else actually frees you up to find that intuitive step that will get you out of that that block. So I try not to get hung up on them uh, and, uh, you know, go off and um, explore and suddenly the answer comes um at a much later date and uh if i relax it turns up you know some people would say that time answers all things and i'm actually a great believer of that that Mm, uh, mm. if i give things space i find the answer uh, and uh, i know where to go from there so yeah that's my approach no that's that's great thanks 
I think that dovetails into uh, some of the things that I think about creative blocks, which is, first of all, um, I really think that even just by calling it a creative block, that that creates a problem for us Mm, because, right? Because think about what we then, like the judgment that we have about a creative block when we call it a creative block, Mm, like, mm. are we block? are like, are we truly blocked up? Is right, the creativity not going to come back? And it's in that space where we like, we're not like, what is it that we're actually experiencing? Is it we just don't feel so creative? And I'll talk about that in a second, but we don't feel so creative. Maybe we have low energy. Um, but whatever it is that's happening and we call it a creative block. And then like right now I'm layering it. So we put a, another layer that's the creative block. And then we you put on top of that, yep. like the judgment about creative blocks because creative block sounds bad. Right. Yeah, so definitely, if definitely. in the instant we're like, I'm not feeling super creative and we don't call it the creative block, then we, we enter that space where Len is, which is like, we're open. Okay. Mm. Why, why am I maybe not experiencing some as much creativity? Well, a, we're not robots. We can't yeah. create, like maybe we just had a period of time where we were super creative and our brain needs to rest. And, or you know, for whatever it is, maybe, maybe our, we're having something going on physically, um, where our energy level is low. Maybe we're having some hard emotional times and we need to give ourselves space. Like usually maybe our creativity is usually an escape from that. And Mm -hmm. we just don't feel super motivated because we have some other heavy things going on. Who knows why? Um, but I think taking away the judgment initially and then kind of diving into why, why not just allow yourself to be open and do the, do lens part. Right. So, and, and I think if we can trust ourselves that we're going to always, I talk a lot about trust, but we can, we know that we're always going to come back out of it and to give ourselves the time that we need and maybe a little space. Maybe we try something new, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that we can do, but I think first just throw away that word creative block. I mean, (laughs) that sounds like radical, but why not? No, that sounds sounds like a great <laughs> strategy because it, it, it. I think you're quite right. You know, it, name, naming it something that uh, you feel you can't get around actually makes it harder to get around. It's like we lose our way a little bit, isn't yeah, it? Like we're, yeah, we're we're losing touch with our intuition and with our sense, and we're getting too caught up in our head, mm-hmm. and so then we label it as a block. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the last time I'm blocked up because I, yeah, Bree's right. Like, um, uh, if it's not going somewhere, well, then I go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. does right. that make sense? Yeah. Here, here's what you can say instead. If it, instead, it, so I love switching around the words that we say. So instead of saying I'm ha- I'm going through a creative block, you can say I'm not feeling as creative right now. Yeah. And that feels more temporary, you know, and it could be whatever you can call it, whatever, or create whatever phrase you want to. But I like, I'm not feeling as creative right now and that's okay. Mm. And that's a great time to look through a book or to go for a walk or do something Mm -hmm. else. And that's what I do. Yeah. That's great. How do you incorporate elements of storytelling and narrative into your landscape photography? And I guess (laughs) I'm interested in... Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. In the I'm to that you use to convey a sense of mood or emotion. It might not necessarily be a you know a story with a, a a beginning, a middle, and an end, but that mood and that emotion. Because you know, why do we create photography and share it with people if you don't want some kind of emotional response to it? I used to think that photography was uh, uh, an incredibly accurate communication medium, just as I thought words were. Mm. And uh, like us humans, we're incredibly flawed at communicating. And uh, I try not to impose um, a, a story into my work that has to be read in a particular way. 
Uh, what I would rather actually do is allow the stories and encourage people to come up with their own stories about what is happening in the work um, and uh, to express that. And I've got a lovely example. I had a a, a little shop in Kiama um, a while ago and I had one of my favourite photos on the wall and this woman came up and started telling me how sad the photo made her and she started crying and it was a, like, it reminds me of my um, my husband who's passed. Like she was a widow and it was an incredibly sad story and uh, f- for me the story of the same photograph is incredible happiness because I fed my son on the on the park bench and the tree that was there and it was a incredibly happily happy memory mm. and it's a photo of a tree and a bench and each person brings in their own stories and i think as i uh, improve as a photographer i have become less li- literal and trying to become less r- literal in my work today and allow more stories to come from the viewer that are deeply personal to them. Mm. And so I do use my work to tell (laughs) incredible stories um, verbally. So I I use my work as a way of storytelling with a verbal story to add with them. And uh, as an educator, I, you know, I, I, I talked earlier about using my tree photographs of the Tarkine mm. to explain the environmental uh, peril that it's in today. So I use my work to tell stories, but I don't expect it to tell a story by itself. And I want the, the viewer to, to come up with their own. And I think I'm getting better at that. Uh, uh, just lately, I've, I've really unlocked a few of the keys to... Uh, allowing people to have more story from their side and less of my literal one being forced in. And I would just worry about whether it feels good for me and whether it's got uh, an emotional contact t- content that works for me. And I don't worry too much about what other, the one I'm trying to project. I'm just looking for one that excites me and, and yeah, gets me turned right. on or something like that. I'll go back to, for me, that's projects. I mean, I, I, Len, I just love that answer. I think Mm. that's, I think that's the, the wise voice of many years of experience (laughs) is what I think. And for me, where I am at, I like, I, I don't know that single images tell a story, although sometimes they do. I I mean, sometimes they're just pretty pictures. (laughs) But I have been finding that I really enjoy um, highlighting some of the lesser seen places or places that we might look over. Um, I'm sharing, I'm actually sharing a little collection right now that I've kept to myself for a while. And it's all about these washes in white. And so in in between the dunes and white sands, it's not just flat. There's these big yep. ridges that kind of look like they look like tire tracks. Real, like I've had people go, "Oh, is that the you know, do cars drive in there?" No, it's just naturally occurring. But we step over those. Like I think a lot of our our life, we were not noticing things on our way to some place, like the destination. And what is it that? that I notice that somebody else isn't, you know, and I love the idea of a project being this nonverbal story about um, bringing attention to something that feels insignificant, but also can be really so beautiful. So um, Len, I have a while to get to where you're at. (laughs) But isn't it fun? Like I, that's one thing I discovered when I had my exhibition here. I did it here at my house and people would say, oh, this reminds me of this, or this feels like this. And I think that's a really, the, a really beautiful part of sharing, you know, being able to share your work with someone and have the conversation and say, what do you see in it? Like, what do you see here? And, uh, and it's, I think it's just so great to see, hear that other perspective because I never know, 
you know, I, of course it means something to me and that's why I made it, but it's so fun to see how all of everyone's unique experiences culminate in their personal story of, you know, something that I've done or a painting that someone else has made. It's really yeah, fun. Yeah. So this is what makes art so interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love both of those answers. That's, that's fantastic. I guess we've talked a lot about photography and uh, that artistic expression side of things. I'm interested in how you guys got your heads together around your podcast, uh, Creative Affair. How did the affair start? What, you know, where do you see it going? How did our affair start, Lynn? <laughs> It was love at first words. <laughs> Actually, we have um, another podcast, which is Matt Payne's podcast, uh, yep. F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen. We have his to thank for how we how our affair started. Okay. Um, and I have to say, Len, is, Len just always likes to ask. He's like, well, you don't get anything unless you ask. Like, no one says yes unless you ask, right? Like mm -hmm. you're at, he's asking things all the time. So do you want to tell it Lynn or should I, or we can combine. We met on an after party. Yes. That Brie was hosting um, for Matt Payne's um, podcast and uh, she hosted an after party for one on mental um, illnesses and uh, yep. there were photography. Three, three what is it? Photography guests. and mental health. Yeah. Mental health. And there were mm. three of us in there talking about our own mental health struggles um, and uh, Brie was the host for this after party. And uh, as soon as we hung up, I just had this thought, I want to keep talking to that woman. She's got something uh, interesting and the conversation isn't over. So I had this intense feeling that the conversation was only just starting and I reached out to her virtually straight away or the next time I, I logged on to make sure I uh, was being seen and then reached out and said, hey, uh, would you like to do something together? Um, I don't know what it is, but I know that we need to keep talking. And I think mm -hmm. uh, 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 that's where it started. Was that Would that be right, Brie? Yeah. And you said, I, and I said, well, let's just have a chat. One of us just said, let's just have a chat. So we did. We got on WhatsApp and we just had an audio chat. And then afterwards you said, let's do it again. And I'm like, cool. I like this. Right. And so, uh, so we chatted again. And then afterwards you said, let's just keep doing this. So that's how it started. Let's just keep <laughs> doing this and talking. And, and so we are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so just so interesting. Um, oh, can, I'm going to tell this story that no one else has heard. That okay. Only pe some people close to me. So our podcast is called A Creative Affair. And this is such an interesting, uh, I think this is such an interesting example about creativity and about growth. And it's, it, anyway, so we decided our podcast was going to be called what is it? Conversations on creativity or something like that, right? Like just, let's just, yeah. just say what it is, right? Yeah. We're just, Call yeah. 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 In fact, even this studio that we're in here on Riverside is called Conversations on Creativity. Yeah, there it is at the, at the top of the URL. Okay. So we titled it that. And then I was asking my husband, I'm like, Hey, can you help me get this URL? And he looks at it and he goes, that's the URL you want. You mean you and this other guy are these big creative people and that's what you came, up, you with. came up with. <laughs> goes, that's what you came up with. And I'm like, I I knew it instantly. Like I was like, oh yeah. I that no, you're right. You're right, but also I hate you. <laughs> so I guess now I have to exercise my creativity. And so I really decided I'm like, I am gonna sit here and dig in because I I you know, want to come up with something. And so I just dug in and sometimes we don't wait for it to come. Sometimes we have to get out there and do the work. And I spent maybe about an hour writing words down, rolling them over, thinking about them, looking up synonyms, just kind of rolling through a bunch of stuff. I mean, I actually kind of like doing this. And it came to me and I sat up and I said, I've got it. Like I yelled it and he goes, I'm watching TV. I'm like, I know, but I got it. So, uh, <laughs> so I knew that was it. And I messaged Lynn. I said, hey, how about we change the name of our podcast to A Creative Affair? And he said, oh, 
you have sold me instantly. Like I know your words, Len. You said you have sold me instantly. And of course, it's a creative affair because look how passionate we all are about our creative work. And we want to talk so passionately about it and talk so much about it. And, you know, and so like once a week, we just have a chat where we have this little creative affair and sometimes we invite people to join us. So anyway, um, yeah, that's kind of where it came from. And I haven't told that story before publicly. So it's kind Fantastic. of fun. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's, this is how creative and, and things come to sharing. be, right? What? No, I'm no, just saying thank you for sharing, yeah. Part of our future is uh, interviewing, I'm not actually interviewing is the wrong word, but having extending our affair uh, to conversations with other people. And uh, we're interested, we've had some really great episodes talking to artists, mm -hmm. um, to writers, and uh, for us, creativity isn't just a, a photography. photography, even though yeah. we're linked yeah. uh, by photography, like Bree's a flautist, um, I'm a writer uh, uh, and it's an educator. Creativity is a way of life, and uh, uh, we, we, our vision is to take it well beyond photography and uh, yeah, to continue this conversation and to to have a, a wildly wonderful affair um, over a period of time where it just keeps growing and uh, we get to know each other better and better and. It takes us hours to record an episode because we spend a couple of hours catching up every time uh, and talking about things. A 30-minute episode. Sh yeah, sharing our lives and we've become incredibly good friends and uh, someone said, uh, uh, you know, where are you going to go? Where do you want to go on your bucket list? And White Sands is now on my bucket list because Bree loves it and, uh, you know, that influence on each other's lives is absolutely incredible and the conversations uh, just keep spiraling off each other. And there it's interesting that it really motivates our work. Mm. Like having this having the podcast actually keeps driving our work at the other end to make things or making books or um and and education. So both of us being educators is a, an incredibly important part of what ties us together is that Bree's a, a coach and uh, I'm a creative educator. And yeah. uh, that, that interesting conversation, because we're trying to help people understand it so that they can grow and grow. And it's so lovely to find out a, you know, a writer or a burlesque dancer listens to our podcast and goes, oh, that's actually helpful for me in planning a ne my next show or writing my next book or um, even awesome. getting an article out. So uh, it, it's an incredibly powerful and exciting thing for us and for our people that listen and follow. Yeah. It keeps well, growing. I've got it's to fantastic. say for myself, it's, it's been incredibly uh motivating and inspirational in, in a number of ways, both with my photography and some of the other artistic pursuits, but also with uh, this podcast itself. It's sort of spurred a few questions in my mind around how I take what I'm doing forward as well. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly thank you for uh, getting together and having the affair and uh, sharing it with us all. Grant, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah, sure. What, what, you know, these things that you've got from our podcast? What's name one? Tell us one of these things that oh. really has um, that you've you've gained from our discussion, uh, from our affair, that's actually helped you. I'd love to know because this is a yeah. it's uh, motivating uh, for us to keep uh, in, in our pursuit of this. I, I think I, I mentioned it very much in passing in in one of my earlier questions, but you. Uh, in a episode I was listening to, or might have been late last year, uh, you talked about having this imaginary grab bag that you put things into, and I'm, bag of tricks. Yeah, the bag of tricks that you then yes. go and reach into, and you pull something out, and you run with that. And it's been something that I've kind of taken to. For me, as I say, both in uh, the, the the photography side of things because I can sort of put things together. And now, I've, uh, funnily enough, I've actually got three or four grab bags that I use 
mentally. <laughs> um, one for my photography, one for the podcast, but one also for some of the business side of things that I'm sort of trying to develop in both the photography and, and, and podcasting. And that concept of being able to dip into there and pull something out and, you know, you, you put a little pin in it and put it away for a while and then pull it out when you think you, you're ready to use it, I, th I think it's a fantastic concept. And, you know, it, it certainly worked for me. One of the things that happens with ideas, and uh, this was reinforced by um, Mr. Rubens only last night listening to, to him talk, um, that if you put ideas in this bag and you don't ever pull them out, someone else does. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> ideas yeah. actually uh, have a life uh, beyond us and tend to come out. And I've put many ideas into my bag and someone else has pulled them out and created them before me. Mm. And at first there was this incredible sadness and disappointment about it that, oh, that was my idea and uh, where's it, how, how dare you take it out of my bag? And I didn't tell them about it. Um, but now I realise that, well, an idea isn't unique to me. Uh, other people are going to have them and they're going to be also quite interesting. So uh, it, it's a good reminder that... Um, it's worth not letting any of them get buried in there too and to, to, to tip it out and have a look around in there and uh, explore explore that. And uh, just a tip for everyone else, my way of doing that is with a, a, a visual diary. I, I keep notebooks okay. and I write in them religiously and I have, they're all over the place. There's one in my camera bag. There's two beside my desk here. There's one beside my bed. There's one in my um, pack. When I go hiking, there's one in my camera bag. Did I say that? And there's ones in my traveling bags, and they yeah. have pens and pencils with them, so I can just keep writing stuff down. So. Yeah, I, I have mine on the phone, all all four of them, and uh, every now and then I just jot stuff down into a, it's um, just a, a note keeping app that I've got, and uh, so I've got little four little buckets in there, or four folders that all the ideas go into, and then I just crawl through and go, okay, I haven't done that one yet. I better get on to it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I love hearing that. <laughs> oh, I, uh, as I say, I lo love listening to uh, to the podcast and, and getting some of those little tidbits that, uh, you know, are really helpful in you know, extending and expanding creativity. Where do you see photography going in the future and what do you see as being the biggest challenges for photographers right now the biggest uh challenge for photography is social media i think and uh the the rise of mediocrity in in the work and uh, I, I think machine learning and uh, ai is going mm. to play into this very, very um, quickly because um, what is popular is becoming so predictable and yep. uh, uh, it's actually uh, not high quality. Uh, it becomes really boring. So the, the photograph that gets a thousand likes on Instagram or, you know, millions of likes actually isn't the best and the most inspiring and uh, uh, incredibly innovative work. Uh, that one only gets a handful of stuff because people don't recognise it and uh, we seem to be losing uh, some of that. So uh, I think that's going to be something that we have to face and work out other ways around um, to find the innovations, to find the the really beautiful creative work that um, is there. And we're going to be flooded with perfection. Yeah, yeah, and I think the way to combat that is to acknowledge our imperfections as uh, artists, and actually embrace that and bring that into our work. So I think the answer is quite quite simple there, and uh, uh, something that will will resolve itself through humanity being fa fallible, uh, rather yeah, than the yeah. computer being quite infallible. 
that's that, that's really interesting, I guess. What about you, Bray? Well, I was actually just on um, Instagram the other day, and I saw that they were I, actually. I've been doing some research, and I see that they're prioritizing. Um, like really, really short reels. So I see like, uh, you know, it's not just like the minute, you know, you can make a reel up to a minute and a half. And I actually do that on my, um, on my coach. I have a separate coaching account um, because I like, I like to kind of, I don't keep them totally separate, but I like to have photography on, you know, one account. And, you know, I, I talk to people yep. on the other one. I really like that. I mean, obviously I like talking to people, but what I'm seeing is I'm seeing our attention spans get shorter and shorter and shorter. And where you, I think a lot of photographers feel like they have to make more and more like grandiose images. And I'm not saying that's me for sure. There's, I think there's a collection of people who are really focused on um, making really, you know, uh, personal work that doesn't have anything to do with that. But, you know, if, if, if you're sharing on social media, you have to, like, it kind of feels like, I'm not saying this is true, but it kind of feels like you have to capture people's attention in like a microsecond. And I really think that- Yeah, well, that's every, everyone scrolling, you don't have a chance to actually engage. Right. And I think this is the biggest challenge is our, uh, the kind of the we're distanced a little bit, you know, I mean, for sure we're a worldwide mm. community, which is really fun. And, but, but we're distance and, and this, you know, we have websites where we're not talking to people or we're having social media where we're just liking things. I'm not saying social media is bad. I love, love social media. This is how I connect with other photographers, but the lack of connection, I think is the biggest challenge when you have a microsecond to capture someone's attention and you don't connect, then I just, I just think the lack of connection is, or connection is what makes photography or the community a really wonderful, um, full experience. And mm. when I feel like we're becoming even more distant, including things like AI art, it feels a little less personal. Everything feels a little less personal. And I just want, I just want all of that back in. I, I don't, I don't care if I create stuff that feels imperfect. Like I don't, I want to look at other people's work that feels imperfect. Like I, that's what I want because I want it to be human. And I, I, and I love, I, cause I just want to like have all the connections. So anyway, what's the future of photography? I don't yeah. really know. I, I, I'm bad at playing these like what if games, but, but if I could predict a future of photography, the future of photography for me would be making connections like more connections in person, even more connections where we have these kind of discussions and that's yeah, what it yeah. is. Yeah. That's my prediction, like not a prediction, but that's my dream for the future of photography and the community. So I don't know. We'll see. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm trying to do my part. Well, I, mean, I mean, obviously, Len and I have this podcast where we're trying to have these conversations and, you know, have a community. And I think that's really important. Yeah, totally. And it, it's definitely one of the things that I've found out of producing the, the podcast is, you know, developing that community of people and connections. And, you know, it's it's just thrown up so many opportunities that otherwise I would have never – a thought of and never been able to take advantage of and for me I, I i totally agree that that sense of community is uh is a big part of it has anyone asked you this question where do you see photography where's where's the future where do you think the future of photography is yeah no one no one's actually asked me the question but i think for me the future lies pretty much as you said with people being creative uh I don't think AI will have much, I guess, influence on people's desire to go out and experience things. And for me, that experience of photography is just as important as the end product uh, and sometimes even more important, you know, from a, a mental health perspective. 
Uh, so I, I can see people going out, and in, in particular landscape photography. For some commercial photographers, though, I'd be certainly thinking the future's not that bright with AI uh, being there on the horizon because if you think about a, a creative director being able to uh, type in a set of words and get a result that's pretty close to what he wants. For free. Yeah, for free. With just his time. That's right. Or her time. Yeah, well, the, the, the five minutes it time. takes to generate <laughs> the image. It's kind of like, well, yeah. So for for some of that commercial product photography and even, you know, photography with models and, you know, maybe, maybe the modelling community uh, is, uh, is going to disappear to, to a certain extent. I, I don't know about that. So it's certainly not the short term, but yeah, I, and I don't know either. We'll we'll have to see. For sure, I was actually I was actually kind of thinking about this question the other day, even though I said I don't like to play with it. But I see kind of a divide where there's the digital, like real digital creators, yep. and then the people who want the human, personal, um, you know, even down to like the film photographers, right? So I think the divide is, there's already a little bit of it, right? You feel it. We feel it in the community, yeah, I think. Yeah. And um, and I think it's not that we're doing different stuff if we're making images and then editing, but when you're now talking about AI and actually like really creating that's not really photography, is it though? So I just, I feel like this is, this is all philosophical, but I just feel like the divide between um, those people who really want the human experience and then those people who love creating the digital work, I think it's just going to get bigger. So it, it is interesting to think about and yeah. we have yet to see. So, yeah. you know. What's your favorite thing about being a photographer? Oh, the immediacy of taking photographs and being able to produce artwork uh, incredibly quickly and uh, spread a, a plethora of beautiful work out so easily. And I, I really enjoy that uh, speed at which I can work. I, I compare that to being a, a painter and a drawer where a drawing would take me a, a few mm. days and a painting would take me weeks or months to do and here I can snap something in a, an eight thousandth of a second and uh, process it uh, with presets yep. and a little bit of processing, um, you know, two or three minutes and I can actually throw a photograph out into the world um, incredibly quickly. So uh, I'm not ADHD but there's maybe there's a little bit of me that um, likes to do things fast and uh, to keep moving and, and work that way. <laughs> I love that it's a never ending challenge. And, and for sure, I, I love the out going out in nature. I love the kind of photography I do, but I haven't, I, I've done a lot of creative things in my life, like little creative things. Yep. And photography has been the first thing that feels never ending. Like it's never ending learning and it's always challenging. And there's so much to experience and do that. I just feel um I I feel like there will all it will always be there for me. Yeah. And I that's my favorite thing. That's what I love about it. So good. That's fantastic. What's your least favorite thing? <laughs> I would if you asked me two years ago, I'd say Photoshop. <laughs> um but <laughs> uh my least favorite thing. Um, thinking about gear, I I just I think gear is just a hundred percent. I want quality yep. stuff that's going to help me do what I want. But like uh, people are like, "Oh, are you going to get the new camera?" I'm like, "No, don't care because because once I've already made the decision and it's totally working for me, I don't need to put any brain power towards it. And so I do not love thinking about new stuff. Yeah. And that's my, talk, talking about gear. Like if something breaks and I'm like, oh, I got to replace it. That's my least favorite thing is figuring out what to replace yeah. it with. <laughs> so no I, no, I don't love that. I have minimal, I feel like I have minimal lenses and I'm happy with them and I don't need any more. Don't tell my husband that because <laughs> I might decide later that that's not true. All right, we'll keep, <laughs> so, we'll keep that between anyway. ourselves. 
<laughs> yeah, just keep that between us because, you know, I might need a 600. No, just kidding. <laughs> How about you, Lynn? Well, it used to be chemicals. Uh, they going into a dark room made me very, very sick. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I to... remember the dark room smells the bad. <laughs> I'd come out with headaches, or when I actually processed my own uh, Ciba chromes or Ilfa chromes, which are um, a, a positive um, process to print from a transparency. Um, the machines were so dangerous at art school; they were um, decommissioned. So I actually just did them myself in mm. um, a, a fume cabinet and I would hand load a, um, a tank with one print in it or a test strip and then I'd pour the chemicals in myself and roll them back and forth and I'd finish the day with a taste of um, metal in my mouth and uh, it would make me very, very sick. So uh, I'm really pleased that... Um, I've discovered digital printing and uh, this whole modern workflow um, digitally. And I think the, the incredible controls that we have at our fingertips um, to be able to control one thing without messing up everything else is absolutely incredible. And uh, it was digital black and yeah. white that really turned me back into um, loving a monochrome and also the whole digital process. I've only got a couple more questions. One is, do you have any inspirational or aspirational photographers that you think I should be talking to on the podcast? Ah. I have, have you spoken to that um, Bree Stockwell or Len Metcalf yet? They're, they're pretty good to talk to, I think, uh, out there. Never heard of them. <laughs> they're like internationally famous. <laughs> <laughs> Are you recommending us, Len? <laughs> it sounded like it. <laughs> oh. um, that's a, that's a really funny. good question. And uh, I think uh, diving into the UK photographic scene is a very um, worthwhile experience. And uh, yep. um uh, some of my friends there, Mark Littlejohn, Tim Parkin, uh, would be a good start. But um, mm. David Ward, Joe Cornish, um, uh, that crowd of people is a, a very, very fascinating group of people to talk to. And uh, I particularly uh, enjoy their company. My favourite to talk to has been uh, um, John Blakemore. And uh, I really love his work, and uh, I was I had such a pleasure to sit next to him during a photographic conference and have a private conversation with him. And he kept ducking out for cigarettes, and I joined him a few times, and I really enjoyed uh, uh, having these in, in, lovely conversations with uh, someone whose book has been on my shelf for my whole life uh, on creative um, black and white printing. So. Uh, there's another one for your list. hundred percent. You should talk to Eric Erlenbush. Okay. And one of the reasons is because he has such, I just think he has such a unique perspective. I love, I uh, like his, um, he's doing these, this double exposure work. That's all about, um, uh, what is it? Like, just these like ridge lines and he's combining mm -hmm. them in camera. I don't even know how he's doing it. It really is like magic to me. I have no yeah. idea. Anyway, um, he has a lot to say about creativity and, and photography and how those fit together. And, and I've, I've gone out with him before and, uh, in he's, he's in, uh, Southern Utah and he's chill yep. and he's really interesting. And he's, I, I just, anyway, um, I, I just think he's a great photographer. So, uh, and I, have you had Jason Pettit on? I haven't yet. Ah, well, you should. I'm sorry. Am I only mentioning men? <laughs> I am a big advocate for female photographers. So, um, I'm actually, I, I'm actually going out of town with some female photographers, which is really fun. But I think Michelle Sons, she is a, an, uh, an up and coming photographer that I think is doing 
really incredible work. She had mm. an ebook come out called The Art of Fog, and she has um, what is her book called? I think it's called Appalachian Dreams. Oh shoot, yep. Michelle, don't don't hate me. <laughs> anyway, uh, her work is just really incredible, and uh, I'll I'll recommend those three. There's whole a huge list, right? Huge list. Oh yeah, I, my my podcast will never end. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Neither will mine. We could always talk about creativity. You can't have one convo about it. (laughs) You can't have one convo. (laughs) Right, right. So, yeah, so good. So good. Well, We've we've come to the most important question that I can ask because this is something that uh, we definitely need to get to the bottom of. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Yes. Okay. That's that, was that super picture. emphatic or what? Yes, it was. <laughs> and you know what's so weird is we have a little thing in our house that we don't eat sweet and meat. So like pork with apples or like I have friends oh, that no. like- pork with apple sauce. Roast pork with apple sauce is magic. No, that's terrible. Oh, no, it's fantastic. <laughs> but and like cranberry here, here for Thanksgiving, cranberry and turkey is a thing. I know. How do you, how do you live without cranberry? <laughs> Caribbean I eat them separately, duh. <laughs> but um, it's so funny because ham and pineapple, it's kind of sweet and it's meat and yeah. it's savory and it's really delicious. I love it. I don't know. I grew up eating it. So now I lo- and I just love it. So oh, what can we do? It's weird that so many people have different kinds of tastes in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll, uh, I, I, I haven't. I still haven't toted it up. I'm 86 or 87 episodes. Hang on, no, your your episode 88, 88 there episodes in. I still haven't actually toted up. I might do it for my hundredth episode. And okay. Re- report back and uh, let everyone know where where photographers stand. Did you? I can't remember. Have you said if you like pineapple on pizza? Uh, I'm a fairly neutral. If it's on the pizza, I won't pick it off. I will eat it. But it's not something that I order specifically. How can you be neutral on this topic? (laughs) It's so polarizing. I'm a fence sitter. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I wonder what Len would say. Infinitely qualified to ask the question. (laughs) I guess so. I guess so. Oh, my goodness. Well, this is so fun. Bree was giving me a, a very emphatic answer to Do you like pineapple on pizza? I definitely do. And um, ham and pineapple is an Australian favourite pizza. Um, uh, I I, I don't mind some um, sour cream and some tandoori chicken on one either. So uh, uh, I have quite wide tastes. And I've been known to. That's that's pretty good. I've also been known, um, Grant, to smear peanut butter on my salad sandwich with a bit of mustard on there too to make a sort of a quasi satay. Okay, feel I haven't, I haven't given that a go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What is a salad sandwich? What is That's that? A, is that a, like an Australian thing? Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, it's a hamburger with a lot with no meat. <laughs> oh, peanut butter? Oh, I've heard of this. Do you put bacon on it too? That's a thing. <laughs> yeah, we put bacon. Well, it depends <laughs> whether you're a meat eater or not. <laughs> A salad sandwich has no meat, and uh, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's not a hamburger with a lot, just with yeah. the patty taken out. And I have been served that in my vegetarian days, and I'm like, "What's the bacon in here?" And oh, he goes, well, you said so no meat. I get That's, it. Yeah. Anyway, but um, uh, a salad sandwich. <laughs> my sister has is a- mostly vegetarian, and she also eats bacon. <laughs> Do you know another lovely thing, Brie? We have um, in our hamburgers. We put a. a uh, beetroot, and that's not that's a, an incredibly uh, unusual. That's a very Australian thing, thing yeah. around Slice, the rest of the world. Of tin beetroot, <laughs> like pickled beets, or just yeah, no tinned pickled beetroot. Okay. Oh, you call it Slice. just you call it beetroot. We just say beets here, but pickled. Yeah. Pi- yeah. They're pickled, right? Well, we buy, I, like we do pickles, yeah. like pickled cucumbers on our hamburgers. It's, so you know. But I mean, we can have a whole podcast pickle. on this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? <laughs> so good. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for spending some time with me today. It's been wonderful getting to know you both uh, a lot better. I normally ask people to tell me where I can, or where people can find their work, but uh, what I'll do instead of asking that question and have you list everything, I'll I'll just put the list into the show notes so uh, everyone can find it. Uh, so thank you very much. It's been absolutely wonderful spending some time with both of you. Well, thank you, Grant, and uh, thank you for answering our questions along the way as well. And uh, I hope you enjoyed our, our little oh, threesome here, and I uh, hope you do it again. <laughs> yes. I did. I did. And I'd be more than happy to do it again. <laughs> Oh, we've converted him. <laughs> mm, we, have. we definitely have. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.